Sorry for the way, it's not. That's the bit about me, which we can ignore. So this all started ages ago, and um, I was working with um, um, the Padre boys and girls, um, and as a Padre developer, just helping them out and doing bits and pieces. And I popped into this interesting character called Adam Kennedy. Some of you will have seen his name all over the seat now. I, I assume some of you will have seen his name there. And um, I was trying to write, I was trying to write the cookbook for the um, Padre plugin, and one of the things I came across was while I was doing this, and I, had, and I was trying to create, create this, and it's the first time I'd done a, a module for seat now. And using the module start for structure, which I presume you're all familiar with, yes? Adam Kennedy was saying to me, oh, what you want to do is, is that you want to use module install, but not just module install, you want to use the DSL unit of it. And I went, why? And he said, because it, because it domain specific language, and it's nice and clean and tidy, and it's free of all sorts of bits and pieces. And um, one of the other developers said, it's great, but you can't tidy it. And so we, we looked at different things, and one of the things it does is, it, it, part of it is, is that there's a, um, a function inside it where it will actually extract and tell you what, what modules you've called within a, in a particular file. And so I thought, okay, I'll, um, I'll write something that, that creates one of these for me. And so that's how this module install generator came about. And so what it does is it generates contents of module install in DSL format, and from this, oh, you can see that it doesn't have any commas, spaces, or anything else that you can be text. It's nice and clean and tidy. The problem is that you can't pearl tidy it, so you can't do anything with it, particularly when you're using lines like this inside it. Which some of you may or may not be familiar that the module install is probably one of the nice things about it is you can do these if can excess um, or um, if with 32 chunks inside it as you go along. So this is how the whole thing started. This all comes from the work that Adam basically inspired people with with, with Oslo. So as it started, um, that was my original scope of things. I thought it might be a good idea to be able to do and um, so. And then I added some more bits and pieces to it and decided that it would be, the reason why it's separated is, is that some of this stuff is, is interesting and some of it is, is less so. In other words, how old is something? Well, one of the things I discovered was when you were looking for files and you were using other people, checking other people's was, you've got no idea how old something is and the version numbers, and what a current version number is. So what this does is, is that What this does is, is that I registered it with, so this is what it does, this is what I wanted it to do in its first instance. So I wanted to have a menu system, I wanted to help on it because I'm stupid and can't remember anything. I don't want to have to go and look it up somewhere else, I wanted to go help for it to tell me, so it's called get along. I wanted to have a voice and a debug so I could get it to chuck out information, I could see everything it found. And we'll show you some of the things. I wanted to be able to ignore this wonderful namespace, this T double colon namespace. Nobody really uses it very much, but some people do. And I wanted to check all sorts of things and go and find what it could do. And then I had other ideas for noisy parents and other things, and the Majopolis catch, because it's not called that, is it? It's called something else, yes? Okay. Yeah, when you leave like, Majopolis, the actual file when you type, you type use, and it's something else. So I registered the name, because people had told me to do that, and I blogged about my shiny toy and I wrote some bits and pieces about it, and it is Bell Prescott. And everyone said, don't write another one, use the one that's there, so I did. And I did a lot of other bits and pieces as well. And then we had take two, so we modified it and changed it so we could see what it was going to do. And so some of the things we took, I took some things out of it and I added other bits to it. And at this time, it's still working in Oslo, as in Meta 1.3. So it's still, at this point in time, thinking about requires, test requires, dev requires, rather than Meta Spec 2. And the Padre catch is nothing other than if it finds a piece of code that's in a Padre plugin, you don't go and say, I want to define all the modules you need in Padre. You just go, Padre, I already know about that. Anyway, just ignore it. Which is the catch. So it used pre scanner instead of writing the own. It uses Meta CPAN API, which is now Meta CPAN client, yes. And it understands how to check for dual life 
and it's got various output format options. And it will scan the whole of the disk if you're in the disk with the script, bin, lib, t, xt. It even understands about shared directories as well. And I even added an, R, an, an, RC, an RC in there so that you could save the options, even though there are only about two or three of them, if in case you were lazy. And the most important thing is a timestamp, which is dead useful for some things you'll see today. So when you run it against a test, uh, I pull off. When you run it, one of the things you get when you run it against something is, is that you just run the code and it tells you the version. And as you can see, this is because of a timestamp, you can see I did this last year. It tells you I'm running it against um, a test environment of mine. And it tells me that the current module, or version of module installed data service time was 1.06. Because everything in the color is things it found. So now for the colors. The orange color is modules that you've requested that are on CPAN. The yellow are dual life modules. And the cyan are modules whose name who are part of something else. So for instance, that module doesn't actually have a name, it's inherited it from its parent. So type standard is an obvious one here, because it comes from type timing. And the thing to note here, and the one that stands out like a sore thumb is foo. Because in this thing, I've got a foo and a bar. And bar doesn't exist on CPAN, and foo does. And, so, okay. That's what it's actually, so what it did is it, it generates uh, an output for you, and it doesn't write the files, it only does send it to the output so you can see what you're using. And it will search, it produces outputs in the format of, in the first instance, this was uh, module installed DSL format. And it tells you how long it's taken, and it gives some suggestions and some other things you might want to add in. And you can see the test requires, and the test recommends. So then after that, we went on, we did CPAN and metadata, we needed more scanners. Because effectively, the CPAN file, in the, the CPAN file is a slightly different format. The CPAN meta spec is totally different. In some ways, it's totally different altogether. And metadata. So when you're looking at the CPAN file, instead of in meta T spec, you haven't got requires, test requires, and recommends. You've got prereqs runtime requires, prereqs runtime suggests, prereq runtime recommends. You've got test requires, test suggests, and you've got develop requires. Now, in theory, there's a develop suggests, but XGD says that there's no point in having it because they mean the same thing, so there's only one there. But test requires and test suggests, there's only two. And then you've got suggests and recommends, you don't have three, even though there should be nine in total. You don't really have nine in the real world, it's a shorter number. So, I wrote additional modules, and they're all in, they're all being given to um, um, Perl, to PPI, to the, to the Perl pre-scanning, PPF, Perl pre-scanning. And the additional modules were written so you could find additional things. The additional modules always run first, before Perl Prescanner, because Perl Prescanner is limited. Perl Prescanner just does what it does and just looks for one thing. It's got no idea within the context it's, been, it's looking for it in. So effectively, it will try and find recommends, runtime recommends, and it will use modules that are either started either encapsulated by a used module or in an eval. And if it finds those, it believes that they are recommends. Because effectively, the author is saying, it'd be nice if I had these, and if I have it, I'm going to get work around it. And so it always searches, searches script and bin, followed by lib. And then it will go on and do tests. And when it does XTs, it just does everything. Because it knows it doesn't matter what it finds in the extra test directory. They're always developed requires because they're already developers. So it understands the difference between suggests. So if you use test requires, it will automatically notice the suggest because if it doesn't exist, your code shouldn't, but your code shouldn't fail. It will just carry on and work its way around it. So here's some examples of um, 
you can see the test requires, and you can also see um, an email on there. So I think we'll point that way to a couple of people on that side. And here's the same thing, but this time showing is a meta JSON file. And you can see that there is slightly more information. All this stuff in grey at the top is just stuff to remind you of what's supposed to be there. These ten lines at the top are all items that are supposed to be here in your in your meta JSON. You can build these things and check them. The thing that seems to be causing confusion by people is the dynamic config bit, and we might say something a bit more about that later. You can see that it still colours everything, it still puts all the information in, and so it always gives you. These are always, at the time it was run, these are what the current versions are of the CPAP. And it also does, for the no index directory bit, so it actually checks the um, local directories rather than just doing a dump of, where you pick up, you'll sometimes see people have got like six items there because it doesn't care when it runs it, whether it finds it, it only just shows you the ones you've got. So part of this was also giving this stuff back, the scanners back, talking to authors via RC email. And just for my measure and fun, I discovered that when I gave my stuff back, that it just so happened that Pearl Breeze Scanner it's written by the pumpkin. He's kind of an interesting person to talk to, but quite a hard person to talk to in some ways, because he's rather busy. I hope you all know who the pumpkin is. Yes? Some of you should definitely know. I don't know why those will know. Yes? Ricardo the pumpkin? He's the key person in Pearl. If we have a problem or there's an error or an issue somewhere, he's the one person who has final say. Actually, he doesn't have final say. Larry has final say. But in reality, Ricardo has final say day to day. And the direction that Pearl goes in, Larry, Larry Ricardo's the person who guides where we're going with it. So picking a module up that having to give back to meant that it's quite difficult to actually um, start the conversation going because you've got to give, provide things to actually entice them to want to converse with you. And it's the same with any author you talk to. You've got to give them something back to get them to give you something. Remember that when you're talking to them, you're not at work, so you can't expect a response five minutes later. You might, you might get a response for a week. It's something that sometimes I think that we forget when we talk to other authors that they've got other things to do. And they do this for fun. So one of the things that came out, came out of this was um, the ability to actually um, show you where files are. And it was another file output format, which was to show the modules I found, where I found them, and also whether that module is actually installed on the machine you're running it on. Now the reason why there are two versions, so if you take archives in, is because it's found by two different scanners. If you wondered why there were duplicate lines. And the missing meant that on the machine I was running it on, that it wasn't actually installed. So it kind of helps you track down things that are missing you. And this was written for, um, this, was, this was all caused by Karen Etheridge, who went, I'd like one of those because I want something that does something like this. So I just now, this is the weird slide of the lot. Um, I'm going to miss this one and jump over to the other two bits because I can't think of the game right. I was going to do MRO and I thought as I got access to this, I would show you the MRO problem. This was raised by somebody else at here today, which was that the Pearl scanners have a problem, both the two pre-scanners have a problem in the sense that they think every time they, they see a piece of code that says require MRO, that they should actually say the version, minimum version of Pearl is version 10. Because they don't understand that what's actually happening is that MRO compact is only being de defined because um, you may have a version of Pearl that's before version um, 5.95. So, what happens is, is that, is that to solve the problem, you scan for MRI runtime requires, 
you scan for the you scan for MR compact and you then ask the question with pearl mineral reversion, is there a blame in there? And if so, does the blame come up with this error, error message? And if it does, you ignore it. And it writes out two two lines, basically telling somebody what it's done, and in the module you still one you can see it's added in the um, the catch. So it means that it puts the right version in. And if you were to run this against either of the other ones or probably together, you will find it will always tell you you need version 5.10. Here's the Java one, the Mr. Jason version, which has done the same. And you can see this time it put classes that the, um, the MRO catches are recommends because it knows it's there. And the last bit. The last bit is, oh, I need to show you this bit here, this table, only because you may or may not be aware between the two the different things, I put this in, that runtime requires, runtime recommends. So what this is doing, and this is caused by doing some bits and pieces somewhere else, when well, you um, um, run debug mode on this, you'll see, um, the bits of the data chunks underneath in what it's doing and how it stores its information. So you can see, um, here you can see a core module, and here you can see a dual life module and it adds more bits and pieces. And here you can see another one, um, and now we're gonna show you the one that's the problem. And why we needed to recast. So here you can see it's in module installed there are Eight occasions, there are eight, eight, areas, eight places where it found YML Tiny. And you can see that the first one it found was found using the, one of the additional scanners for Evo. The second one was a Pearl pre scanner. The third one was a pre scanner. The fourth one was Royal Evo. And then there were four, four found using in the, te in the um, uh, test environment. It initially thinks that, that it should be runtime recommends as the, as the correct definition of where it should live. But that's wrong. And the reason why it's wrong is, is that if we if we ignore the first the test ones because they they don't they're, we're not interested in tests we're only interested in library and we look at zero and one resolve to runtime resolve to zero because the additional scanners always take precedence over pearl pre scanning because they always take place they always come first. You can see that we end up with a scenario where we only end up with three. That's right, and this means that because it, it, this meta file here is, is called, with the way it's called here, runtime requires, it takes precedence. So what I did was I wrote a, um, a recast that catches this stuff. So we will then go through, and it catches it, and it writes the correct one in. And if you run debug on this, it's all debug is done with data printer, and it chucks out loads and loads and loads of information and you can see where, how it found the information it was looking for. And the only reason why it can do this is that it keeps all this information while it's doing it. All of the other techniques that you use find something and they either keep one copy or they just overwrite it so they only have one instance of it. So they never remember when they scan a distribution where they find anything. So it doesn't matter whether it's the Meta 2 um, spec um, prereqs utility, the object one, it only has one instance in it of each thing it finds. So it doesn't have the history because it keeps it likely of what it's found. It's only because of that I can do these other things. So if you find things that the scanners get wrong, if you tell me, I'll write a heuristic patch for it. And the bit I forgot to point out I want to point out is on here is that foo actually has a number that's its version number locally specified it wasn't point two because that's the version of foo in Meta CPAN. so you will get differences between version numbers and you may see things that are different so the different bits and need to look at it it's nothing more than a tool to help you to see. You still have to make a decision as to how you want things to go. But effectively what it will do is it will show you this really quickly. And it will show you in a format 
that you want. So you can either have module install as your output, you can have module install DSL, you can have a distiller format, a meta JSON, CPAN file, it doesn't care. You can pick the output format you want. Or you can do something like in front. So the two catches were there for the they were asked. That's it. Sorry I overrun. Sorry about the fact at the beginning. If you've got any questions, go for it. Enjoy the week. Okay, um how um the sort of does it have a sort of does does Midgen have a have an API so rather than using it from the command line you could write a program that uses Midgen to scan bell you data. You can, there is an example in there that will enable you to be able to hook, to hook straight into it. And in the moment, on the back burner, is the ability to use the, I can't what to call it, the Pearl, David Golden's um, um, uti uh, object utility that stores the information that Pearl Prescanning uses. I'm going to generate an output for that because the CPAN meta requirements. That's the one. The CPAN meta requirements because is it Kentel? Is his name the guy in New Zealand? Yes. Wants to have a go at using it in Distiller because he's interested in he's interested in um, he's interested in. Um, He's interested in this stuff here. Mm -hmm. He wants to be able to do this. He wants to be able to do this, the runtime recommends. But I think Kentel thinks they should be runtime suggests. But changing it, it's the problem is you can't, find, you can't identify it yeah. at the moment. So yes, that's, yeah, that's in the process of being worked on. But you can, as an example, because um, um, it's already the other, the examples used by um, Fabrice, the web-based um, Perl editor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got it. That uses it for there. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, then, people. <laughs>